Well, good evening. Let's see everyone here tonight. And welcome back those we didn't have a chance to see this morning. Tonight's lesson is entitled, Seven Blunders of Man and Their Consequences. Taking our text from John 8, 24, and chapter 12, verse 48. We're going to be looking at these two passages in just a few minutes. The title is kind of a play on the words, The Seven Wonders of the World. The seven wonders of the ancient world were magnificent accomplishment of men's feet, men's ingenuity, and craftsmanship. For those that may not be terribly familiar with the original seven wonders of the world, if you look up the seven wonders of the world, you're going to get conflicting uh, lists. There have been lists that have continued to go on all the way until today, but according to many historians of the first couple centuries, these original seven, seven wonders of the world, uh, I'm going to name them for you. You might not, I found this collage of all seven, so to help name them, as you see the scroll atop the slide, you're going to see that it goes, they, they keep with the same order as the picture. And so we're, not, we're going to be going across. So the first one on the list is the Great Pyramid of Giza. This was a memorial tomb for the powerful pharaohs of Egypt. It's one of only the original seven wonders still standing. And it's still a mystery today how it was built. Historians have all kinds of, of theories ranging from aliens to uh, massive slave labor and all these different kinds of technology that is no longer uh, no longer exists for us to, to uh, know how they did it. And so it was considered and still is considered on all the lists the Pyramid of Giza. The second right across from it is the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. This was built by King Nebuchadnezzar for his wife Aminus. She was of media. She was homesick and so he built these Hanging Gardens to make her feel more at home in the city of Babylon. It is reported that when Alexander the Great marched into Babylon to conquer on his conquest of the whole known world, that when he came into Babylon and saw the Hanging Gardens, he stopped what he was doing and wept. He was so overcome by the beauty of it. And so it has been on the list of the original seven for a long time. And if you go down one, one more to about right here, you see the Temple of Artemis of the Ephesians. Or, she was also known by Diana, her more popular Roman name by those in the Roman culture. And so it was the Temple of Diana or Temple of Artemis. This was a feat of ingenuity. It took more than 120 years to build. And it was more than 400 feet long. And all along the sides it was decorated with gold and jewels. Travelers far and wide came just to see the temple at Ephesus, the temple dedicated to Artemis. And so it was on that list of the original seven wonders of the world. Next to it is the statue of Zeus at Olympia, carved at the site of the first Olympic Games. It was more than 40 feet high and was considered quite impressive. And it kept falling apart. They had to keep moving it in pieces. If you study the history of this thing, it didn't stay together very long, if I remember the history right. They, they had to keep moving it. And for the Olympic Games, they would re-resurrect resurrect it or erect it back together and hope, hope that it held because it was so massive. And right down from there is the mausoleum at Halicarnassus. It stood approximately 148 feet in height. I say approximate because different historians disagree on the exact height, but approximately 148 feet in height. Each of the four sides was adorned with sculptural reliefs created by one of four well-known, renowned at the time, Greek sculptures, sculptors. So they had four famous Greek sculptors, each one do their take on each side of this building, making it, apparently, for all those who saw it, very, it was very magnificent. And the Colossus of Rhodes stands right next to that in the picture. This is a statue of the Greek Titan Helios. It was erected in the city of Rhodes, and it stood over 107 feet high, making it one of the tallest statues in the ancient world. Not one of the tallest buildings, one of the tallest statues in the ancient world. And, and the seventh is the Lighthouse of Alexandria. This was a lofty tower built by the Ptolemaic Kingdom. So the Greeks, the Ptolemaic Kingdom, on the coastal island of Pharos at Alexandria, Egypt. Its height has variously been estimated at somewhere between 393 and 450 feet. Again, historians differ. Different accounts differ on its exact height, but those reporting on the height were stunned by the sheer height of it, making it the, one of the tallest man-made structures on Earth for many centuries. 
and the, the industrial, it was not topped really until the industrial revolution age as buildings began getting higher and higher and higher and dwarfed this Alexandria lighthouse. But for many centuries, this stood as the tallest man-made structure. And so as people traveled the, the world to see these seven wonders and they talked about them and made their own lists, they were all, they were all struck by the beauty of it. However, if you were to try to go back into the ancient world, to all these different cities, and see these things, you'll see that they're almost all gone. There's only one of these original ones standing. And all but two of those on the list are Greek. Many lists have surfaced from Roman times till now. During the times of Rome, they had their own list because they wanted to boost their accomplishments. The Great Pyramid of Giza and the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, of those two, were the only ones non-Greek. One was Egypt, the other was Babylonian, all the rest were Greek. So during the time of Rome, they had their own list, wanting to boost their accomplishments. And the point is, is that most of them are all gone. No matter what list you look at, they're all gone. They're not around anymore. You can't go to Rhodes and see that magnificent 107-foot statue. You can't go and see the mausoleum at Halicarnassus. You can't go and see the temple of Ephesus. It's gone. Those things are gone. The point is, it's not permanent. And it didn't matter how much the accomplishment stung and struck the people who saw it. They're gone. That's not permanent. Man-made structures do not last. Well, there are what I call seven blunders that man can make that just like those seven wonders of the ancient world that are no longer in, all they are is a distant memory, they're gone, they're erased from our sight, we can't go and see those things. There are seven blunders of man that have eternal consequences that they too will be like a faded memory and something that is completely erased in eternity. And so let's take a look at these seven blunders. Blunder number one is to reject Jesus as God's son. We looked this morning at Peter's account in Acts 2, 22 to 23, and last week at Paul's account in Philippians 2, 5 to 11, that all attest that Jesus is God. That he is the son of God. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit, embracing that fully man's side. He even experienced natural birth. It was a supernatural conception, but not that should not be confused with a natural birth. Matthew 1, 18 to 24. To reject Jesus as the Son of God is to die in your sins, Jesus said. In John 8, 24, he said, Therefore I said to you, you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Unless you believe I am the Anointed One of God, unless you believe I am the Christ, was the context, that's why it was so important this morning when we looked at Peter as he wrapped up his sermon in Acts 22 through 36. He says, this Jesus, whom you crucified, is both Lord and Christ. It's important that we understand that permanent fact, that it cannot be changed. If we reject Jesus as God's Son, there's no sacrifice standing to make us right with God. To reject Jesus as the Son of God is to die in your sins. Notice what he said about those who reject him in John 12, 48. He said, he who rejects me and does not receive my sins has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. Jesus is saying that choice that you make to reject him is going to come back to get you because you're going to be judged by his word that he spoke, testifying of who he is on the last day. You can't outrun God and you can't outlast God. His word will be there on that last day. In 1 John 2, 22, 4, 3, 2 John 1, 7, as we looked at this morning in 1 John 4, 3, that says, if you don't believe Jesus came in the flesh, verse 4 says, you are the Antichrist. This rejection makes one the Antichrist. Some people today make a big deal about the, the Antichrist. John said the Antichrist was already there in the first century. Antichrist just simply means against Christ. John's saying, if you reject him as the Son of God, if you reject that he came in the flesh, you are against Christ. Why? Because you're rejecting what he said. And what so many said. He came as fully God and fully man. We saw that in last week in Philippians 2, 5 to 11. And we looked at that in detail this morning in Acts 2, 22 through 23. And Jesus said he is the only way to the Father. John 14, 6. He said there's no other way to get to the Father but through him. So if you bypass Jesus, say, I don't believe in Jesus, but I believe in God. Well, Jesus said you can't get to the Father except going through him. You have to believe that he is who he said he is. In Acts 4.12, Peter made the case. In Acts 4.10, he names him as Jesus of Nazareth. He says in verse 12, there's no other name given under heaven by which men can be saved. 
And we see in so many passages, 1 John 1, 3, verse, verse 7, 1 John 3, 23, 4, 15, 5, verse 1, and verse 5, and verse 20, and 2 John 2, 1, verse 3, Jesus is the Son of God. The, whole, the four Gospels are written, all concluding with the same message, Jesus raised from the dead as the Son of God. Paul, in standing in Areopagus in Athens in Acts 17, said, this is the proof that God furnished that there is a day of judgment, and all men are going to be judged by the one who was raised from the dead. He says, that's all the proof we need, that no longer does God overlook ignorance, but now everyone is commanded to repent, and that day of judgment, that confirmation was in Jesus raising from the dead. It is that important to know that Jesus is the Son of God. And so to reject Christ as the Son of God is to side with the Antichrist or Antichrists and die in your sins. And remember, there isn't just one Antichrist. The Antichrist is any spirit, any soul that decides to reject God, to reject Jesus as coming from God, to reject Him in the flesh, to reject His mission, to reject that He's the Son of God. John says it over and over through his Gospels that, or his, his epistles, that that one is the Antichrist. And so we're not just looking for one, we're looking at the general attitude that rejects Christ. And a blunder number two that will keep you from heaven is thinking that our own goodness can save us. How many times have we heard that? Well, God would never send so-and-so to hell. They were just so good. Well, good according to who? If they, didn't, if they didn't have their sins washed away by the blood of Jesus and be made a, a child of His and a member of the body which He will save, it doesn't matter how good or moral that person thinks they were or however many people think that that person was good and moral. And today, lots of times, especially in popular culture, you hear people being measured up to Mother Teresa. They'll say, well, she's no Mother Teresa, but she's this. And they're saying, well, she can't attain to that. That's the wrong standard. They're placing the wrong standard on what goodness and morality is. See, Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned. Because we've all sinned, and we all are in need of the redemption only found in Jesus. In Hebrews 9.22, the Hebrew writer said, And according to the law, one may almost say, All things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. And his point is, the blood of bulls and goats didn't bring about that forgiveness. As you get into Hebrews 10, as the writer is making his case that the old things went away, the only blood, the sacrifice made for all time, was Jesus. And it's in his blood that washes away the sins of mankind. There was need of the shedding of blood. And Romans 3, 24 to 26 tells us that one that is obedient to God through, as we see in Acts 2, 38, 22, 16, Galatians 3, 27, that when we are baptized, we're baptized into Christ, we're washed of our sins in His blood, and we are made clean. Romans 3, 23 says, or 3, 24 through 26 says, we're justified in the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in His blood we're forgiven of sins. We are redeemed. That means we're bought back from our lawless way of life and brought under that law of liberty. Just the, the one that we all turn to when we want to talk about someone that was good and moral is we turn to Acts chapter 10 and we talk about Cornelius. Cornelius was a good man. By the first couple passages in Acts chapter 10, we're told he was a good man. But he still needed to hear the words by which he could be saved. He needed to hear the words that he and his household could be saved. Look in Acts 11 and verse 14. <coughs> in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 to 6, we find that he's praying to God. And God answers his prayer with a vision of an angel. And the angel says to him, in verse 5, he said, in verse 4, he said, The angel says, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He's staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. So as soon as that angel departed, Cornelius did what God commanded, and he sent the men to Joppa, and we know the rest of the story. What I want you to look at is Peter's own account, as he's giving an account to this, to this interaction with Cornelius and his household. Look at what he says in his own words in Acts 11, verse 15. Or, I'm sorry, verse 14. Acts 11, verse 14, we'll read through verse 15. 
In verse 13 it says, And he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here. And notice Peter fills in what Cornelius said the angel said to him and the reason bringing Peter to him that we didn't see in verse in chapter 10. He says, And he will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. Cornelius was a good and moral man. These were told he was a God-fearing man. And yet the angel said, Send and bring Peter here. Why? So that he'll speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. The angel answering Cornelius' prayer was not salvation. He still had an obedient thing to do. He had to send the men to Joppa and bring Peter to him. Not only did he have to bring Peter to him, then he had to listen to what Peter said. And not only did he have to listen to what Peter said, but then he was given a choice to either obey the gospel or to choose to send Peter home packing. And you see, at the end of chapter 10, Peter says, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who received the Holy Spirit just as we did, Ken. And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. In verse 15 of chapter 11, Peter speaks about that Holy Spirit account. He says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. And then he remembers the words of Jesus that John baptized with water, but Jesus would baptize with the Spirit. Peter's saying the, bap the baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't what saved him. That's what a lot of people teach, is that when the Holy Spirit fell, Peter says that was a sign that they could receive repentance. The Jews understood what, what he was talking about, and they rejoiced. Cornelius was a good, he was a moral man, he was one who feared God, but he still needed to hear the words that he could be saved by. So in Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, we find the blood of Christ justifies and saves. It says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. In Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said his blood was the new covenant for forgiveness of sins. There's no other way to come in contact with that blood but to obey the gospel through baptism, having our sins washed away. So many people want to teach prayer and we just don't read that. We read it as the baptism, obeying the gospel, that we are justified in his blood. Our own goodness, no matter how moral, no matter how righteous we think we are without Christ, it cannot save us. Only the blood of Christ can save us. And that only comes through obedience to the gospel. The third blunder that many people seek to do to find salvation is looking only at things seen. Theirs is a ritualistic service to God. They, there's idolatry and all manner of things. Even people claiming to worship God will talk to an idol, talk to these pictures of saints or whatever it is, and thinking that they're having some mediator on their behalf when we find that there is only one mediator. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, we're told that things seen are temporary. The saint must look to things not seen, not the things on this earth. It says, while we look not at the things which are seen, 2 Corinthians 4.18, it says, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Saints must be careful not to fall into the trap of worldliness. 2 John 2, 15 to 17. We're told that we're not to love the world or the things in the world. Remember why? Because, because they're all going to burn up. They're all going to perish. And so we're not to look at those things. We're to do the will of God, and that is how we will be saved. Colossians 3, 1 to 3 says the focus must not be on earthly things, but on the heavenly, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Jesus told the story in Matthew 16, 19 and 20, and verse 30. He taught his disciples not to put trust in riches, but in him. In Mark 8, 36, he says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? 2 Peter 3, 10 to 13, the reason for all of life's goods he says that the reason we're not to put our, our treasure and our trust and our riches and our material blessings, Peter tells us why in 2 Peter 3, 10 to 13. All of life's goods, all the things that we know, even things on the periodic table that say cannot burn, will burn with intense heat. They will melt, it says, with intense heat. It will all be burned up. And so, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Knowing all those things, that things of the world will burn up one day. And where the focus is to be, Jesus is talking about not being anxious for anything. And so he says there in verse 19, 
in chapter 6. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Which is why he then says later on in verse 33, where he says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He's saying, so don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow brings its own troubles. Worry about today. Today is what you have control over. He says, don't worry. Don't be anxious about those things. You need to make sure that your treasure is where your heart is. And your heart better not be on earth. Because that can be stolen. That can be destroyed. That can be corroded. It can be corrupted is what he's saying. Don't put your trust there. In fact, in Luke chapter 12. He tells the story of the rich man looked at his, his, all his blessings and said, I'm going to build more storehouses so I can have more. And I'll, I won't have to ever work again. I'll just say, soul, verse 19, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. <coughs> God said to him in verse 20, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And so he said in verse 22, and he said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. And he goes on to tell them all these things about the birds that are taken care of. And he says, you're much more valuable than a sparrow. God will take care of you. This goes back to Matthew chapter 6. He says, don't be covetous, don't be greedy, don't put your trust in riches on earth. He says, now who will own all that you have prepared. We don't take any of it with us. We need to make sure that we have the kind of character that will outlast material blessings, material goods. <coughs> but there are so many people who put their trust in riches on earthly things and not in God. Those who trust in riches are like the rich fool. They will lose their soul. The fourth blunder is people think they're too bad to be saved. And this somehow becomes an excuse. Have you ever heard someone say that? You wouldn't want me in your church. You wouldn't want me with you because I'm so bad. I'm so terrible. I'm so evil. Fill in the blanks. There are people out there that say such things. And they might believe it. I, I've done horrible things that you can't even imagine. You wouldn't want me with you. Really? We can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 to 10, and see the kind of people that made up the Corinthian church. And yet, they were sanctified, washed, justified. Those that come to God, God will forgive their sins if they will obey Him in the gospel. And if they will try to live as righteously as they can, they can be forgiven. But there are people that think they're so bad, they're beyond saving. And so, as I've discussed these things with people who come at me with this argument, I've come up with two examples to use to ask them if they've done these things. How evil were the Jews on Pentecost? We looked at this this morning in Acts chapter 2. In verse, if you go back to Acts, we'll look at this in succession and say, ask and answer the question, how evil were the Jews on a day of Pentecost? Including the 3,000 that obeyed the gospel. Notice what Peter says about them in verse 22. He says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with Miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Focus on verse 23. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. He's saying the Messiah, the anointed one that you've been waiting for, came in amongst your midst and he proved it with signs and wonders and miracles and you put him to death, delivering him up to godless men and nailed him to a how evil were the Jews on the day of Pentecost? They were guilty of the murder of the Son of God. So these people sometimes that say they're so bad they're beyond saving, you can ask them, well, did you commit murder? Some of them might even say yes. And if they do, point to the next passage. What do we do? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. Sometimes they might say no, they did not. And they too. The prescription is the same. Repent. Be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Look in Acts chapter 7 and verse 52 as Stephen wrapped up his sermon. He said, Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, 
whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. Stephen's talking to those who are still guilty of the blood of Jesus and had not repented. And he says, you are his betrayers and murderers. And they stoned him for it, adding blood upon blood. Now, how evil were the Jews on Pentecost? They were guilty of the, of the blood of the sinless Son of God. And we can turn over to Acts chapter 22 and we can ask the question, how evil was Saul of Tarsus? How evil was he? In Acts chapter 7 and verse 58, we find he condoned the stoning of Stephen. And in fact, he guarded the stoner's coats. We're going to look over in Acts chapter 8. <coughs> We're going to look at this in succession. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. It says, But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Go to chapter 22. Go to chapter 22, starting in verse 4. Again, Paul speaking in his defense, admitting to the wrongs that he had once committed. And he says in verse 4, he says, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons. As also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify, from them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. And in chapter 26, so not only did he drag men and women off and put them in prison, he says he persecuted it to the death. He persecuted the way to the death. So look in chapter 26, starting in verse 9. So then I thought to myself I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. <coughs> How evil was Saul of Tarsus? Known the stoning of Stephen. He imprisoned innocent men and women, dragging them from their homes, locking them up in prisons in Jerusalem. And then you find out he, it says in verse 11, he says, And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme, and being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. Trying to force them to blaspheme, what do you think that entailed? Torture. He was trying to get them to blaspheme the name of God. So not only did he lock up innocent men and women, not only did he torture them, but he also cast his vote against them to have them put to death. And so some people today will say, I'm so bad, I'm beyond saving. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Ask them if they're as evil as the Jews on Pentecost who were guilty of murdering the Son of God, the very one they were waiting centuries for. Or if they, like Paul, had persecuted the way, persecuted the church unto death, Notice his redemption in verse 16 of Acts chapter 22. Ananias was sent to this murderous man. God told Ananias to go and deliver him a message that he's going to see what it means to suffer for God's sake, for Jesus' name's sake. So in verse 16, Ananias delivers that message, starting back in verse 12, and he says, Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. All those things that Paul, by his own mouth, admitted to having committed, had those sins washed away in baptism. Calling on the name of the Lord, just as Joel foretold what happened, as Peter said that Jesus is that Lord that we need to call upon to have his sins forgiven. It's no wonder that we can read Luke 19.10. Jesus said, He came to seek and save the lost. And by his blood, men may be forgiven. Yes, even men who have committed murder can have their sins forgiven. So we are not too bad to be beyond saving if we will humbly submit, obey the gospel in the prescribed way, and live a righteous life forsaking those other ways of life. We too can have forgiveness. And blunder five that men make, thinking faith only will save us. In Romans 3.28, Let's read Romans 3.28. I'm sure your versions are going to be very close to mine. Reading from the New American Standard in Romans chapter 3 and verse 28. I think your version is going to be close to mine unless you're reading a German copy. In Romans 3.28 it says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Martin Luther, as he translated this from Latin into German, 
looking in the, and translating it from Greek, he added the word alone, which has caused many people to fall by the wayside. He added the word alone, even though it was not even in the Latin, and it wasn't in the Greek before the Latin. As your version reads, and as mine does, it says, we maintain a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. He added the word alone. And from that, even though many, my footnotes guy says, Martin Luther added this word, and even though it's not in the Greek, it still stands as a principle by which we must live. No, it does not. Because that's not what Paul wrote. He did not write, we are saved by faith alone. That was man-made, it was added, and men, mankind all the way till this day. Even though we have translations that have rejected that idea, still teach faith only. And it came from Martin Luther adding the word alone in Romans 3, 28. So I would ask, what about grace? In Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, it says, by grace you've been saved through faith. Notice it doesn't say faith alone. It says, by grace you've been saved. And there are those that teach, grace has saved us. But then they latch on to that faith only, even though that's not what it says. But what about the blood? We're told that grace saves us, but what about the blood? Ephesians 1, 7. In Christ's blood, there's redemption and forgiveness. You see that it's not one or the other, it's all. It's all combined. The grace of God is the blood of Christ. What about repentance? Without repentance, then all men can be saved no matter what kind of godless life we might choose to lead. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he said, if you reject me, you'll die in your sins. It's the same thing. If you go to God with unrepent unrepentance, you will likewise perish. You will die in your sins. What about confession? Acts 8, 36 to 37. When the Ethiopian eunuch says, here's water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. What did that belief with all his heart cause him to do? He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans 10 says, with the mouth we confess Jesus is Lord. That is that confession that we must make. So what about baptism? Peter says it succinctly in 1 Peter 3.21, baptism now saves you. You see that there are several things that it says we're saved by. And it's all wrapped up in grace. God didn't have to give us the cure for our sins. But he did. That's that grace of God. But we must repent. We must confess. And we must be baptized. In order to be washed away. Have our sins washed away. There are several things. By which we're said to be saved. We're not saved by any one of them. To the exclusion of the others. They're all commanded by God. James 1 and verse 26. Says faith without works is dead. He says for just as the body without the spirit is dead. So also faith without works is dead. We must, it must be an obedient faith. It's not a faith that we say, I believe in God, and yet I live however I see fit. Or I believe in God, and I'm going to do righteous things according to my own will and what makes me happy. We must be obedient to God. James 1, 18, 25 says, We must in humility receive the word and plan it that will save our souls. And then we can't be those that are hearers of the word and hearers only, but after hearing it, we must do it. Otherwise, he uses the analogy of a man who looks in the mirror at his natural face and then goes away, turns away from the mirror, and forgets what he looks like. He says that's what it is when you hear the word of God and you don't act on it and you don't do it. It's not enough to claim, I believe in Jesus. I must live it. I must act it. I must practice it. Christ is the author of eternal salvation of those who obey him. We see that in Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Obedience is important. And blunder number six. There are many people who might be all who might be right on all those points. And they might think they've been baptized, they they have their sins forgiven, but then they think the church is unnecessary to salvation. There are some who practice and teach, choose the church of your choice. It doesn't matter which one. Whatever makes you happy, whatever has the perks and benefits you're looking for. Such an attitude implies the church doesn't matter. It's a social club. You join whatever social club you want. The church doesn't save. But the church is the saved. No, the church alone isn't going to save anybody. The church is comprised of those who are saved. Ephesians 5.23. And using the, the physical metaphor of marriage, man and woman. He's a husband and wife. He's, 
He says to the Ephesians in Ephesians 5.23, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. And he goes on and describes that we don't have to wonder what the body is. The body is the church. We see this in Acts 2.47, that those who were baptized were being added to the church, those who were being saved. Ephesians 2, 13 to 17 talks about this reconciliation that we have with God in the body. We're Gentile and Jew were made one new man in one new body. We see that also in Ephesians 4, 1 to 6, 5, 23, all the way through 27. At the end of this passage, at the end of chapter 5, Paul says, this is a mystery that I'm speaking about, but it's about the church. He's not just talking about husband and wife relationship. He's talking about using something physical to imply something spiritual. If we can understand it in a physical sense, we can get the spiritual sense that Christ is the head of the church. The church must be subject to Christ in all things. And that Christ will save the body. He will save those in the church. So then how can we teach the church is unnecessary? Could a soul be saved and not be part of the church? That of which Jesus is the Savior? Ephesians 5.23. Let's look, go to its logical conclusion. If one could, and two could, or three, and after that, I mean, where do we stop? Ten thousand? Ten million? Christ's blood redeems man. Ephesians 1, 7, 2, verse 13. He bought the church, Acts chapter 2, 20, verse 28, and Ephesians 5, 25. So could a soul be saved apart from that church? Does that make Christ's blood non-essential? He will return one day to get his bride, the church. He says this in Ephesians 5.27. He's going to present him to the Father. Revelation 19.7-8 talks about this marriage feast of the Lamb where the bride of, of the Lamb is presented to the Father, spotless and holy. The righteous acts of the saints being the white linen that she's clothed in, pointing back to what we read in Ephesians 5.27. Just as in the days of Noah, that they were saved in the ark, the saved today are in Christ. Galatians 3.27 says those who are in Christ clothe themselves with Christ. Revelation 19.7-8 says it's the righteous acts of the saints. That is that bright, that clean, that white linen. And the last blunder, blunder number seven. Those who think we have lots of time to one day obey God. Some think they'll have all the time in the world to either one day obey God or to repent and come back to God. Young or old, we have no promise of a tomorrow. James 4, 14 says, Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Life is a vapor. We don't know if we're, what's going to happen tomorrow. We can have all the plans that we want, but we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if we're going to have that one day. Young children. Young children die. It's an unpleasant experience, but it happens. Disease. As we're well acquainted with, especially in current events, school shootings, school violence, etc. Young adults die. Disease, accidents, etc. Just, I think it was last night after midnight, we were reading of a 38-year-old man on a motorcycle who struck a moose. That was fatal. Okay. We don't, he, who knows what plans that man had when he got home or wherever it was he was going. We don't know when life is going to end. If we're going to meet our maker. Young adults die, disease, accidents. Older adults die, natural causes, disease, accidents, etc. Everything that can kill a young child can kill a young adult can kill an older individual, and vice versa. Ecclesiastes 12.1, Solomon warned, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth. Ecclesiastes 12.1. It's so important that we remember our Creator in the days of our youth and hold on to that until our mature years. 2 Corinthians 6.2 says, now is the day of salvation. It says, For he says, At the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I want you to remember Acts 24 and verse 26. <coughs> Paul was giving his defense before Felix and Drusilla. They were immoral people. Felix was one of the only ones on, if not the only one, one of the only ones on Roman record, having been a slave pardoned, set free, and made elevated to the position of governor. Historians of that day define Felix as a, a man with a slave mentality ruling as a king. He was a 
king with a slave mentality. And so he engaged in gross immorality and debauchery, thinking that the world owed him because of his time as a slave. And so he took whatever it was he desired, including another man's wife, Drusilla, had no right being married to him. They were both immoral people, and Paul's teaching were told three things that caused him to tremble with fear. Paul was teaching to him about righteousness, something that was lacking in their lives. Self-control, something very lacking in their lives, according to secular historians at that time. And the judgment to come. Felix thought he only answered to Caesar. And here Paul talking about a higher power that even Caesar is going to one day bow the knee to. And so it's only right that we read. Felix became terrified. But it didn't cause him to make the right decision. His, terrify, his being terrified caused him to procrastinate. He said he wanted Paul to come back at a more convenient day. But then we read that he had two more years that he came often to speak with Paul. Never is it recorded that he had that more convenient day. People think they have all the time in the world. Their Felix, as far as we know, had two more years with Paul. And it didn't cause his heart to become humble to God's will. In 2 Peter 3.10, we find the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Even if we're alive at that time, that we hear the shout of Jesus, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, even if we're alive to hear that, it'll be too late for change. Time will be called no more. Judgment day will begin. We must obey now and be ready and alert for his coming. That's why Peter says in 2 Peter 3.12, you know all these things are going to happen. Therefore, knowing what should it do, it should cause you to be holy and godly in all your conduct. He says, that's the kind of people you ought to be. We don't have all the time in the world. We have today. And we only have today while it is still today. While we draw breath. Any one of these seven blunders will condemn one soul forever in eternity. That's the consequence. Any one of these blunders is rejecting Christ. John 12, 48. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 says... For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Paul, as we looked at last week in Philippians chapter 2, he wrapped up his discourse on the nature of Christ, saying about Christ's exaltation. He says in verse 9, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. At that time, every knee will bow and confess Christ as Lord. If they didn't live their lives in accordance with that, that admission, that confession, it's going to be too late. The condemnation of Christ awaits all who fail to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I would submit to you that just as the seven wonders of the world have mostly disappeared and are only in memory, the second blunders of man will cause one to pay the penalty of eternal destruction, separation from God, away from his presence. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9. Not even to be a distant memory to those who are enjoying life and bliss. Just as these things are a distant memory, I've never seen those ancient wonders of the world. I haven't even seen the one that still exists in person. But when we reach eternity... And after we confess Christ as Lord and we are separated out, the sheep to his right, the goats to his left, these things will be no more. If you have committed one of these seven blunders, or more than just one, if you've committed any of these, it will be too late for you. It will be too late. The question tonight is, are you ready to serve and live for Christ today? If not, you will live with that blunder forever. Don't make an eternal blunder, but obey the gospel today to live forever where time will cease to exist as we know it. We can't even come, uh, fathom what an eternity is, but we're told we'll live with God in His abode, with Christ and all His fellow heirs for all eternity. We'll live with Him forever. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, you need to be to repent and be baptized into His name, no longer living for your selfish desires and ambitions, no longer living for whatever these excuses might have been to keep you from God, but to repent and be baptized into His name, the only name that can save rising out of the waters and newness of life, having new purpose, new goals, new motivations. And if you are a Christian tonight, not living the way that you are, don't wait till it's eternally too late. Don't say, one day I will repent. We don't know if we have that one day. 
but we know we have today. So don't wait. Make it today while well, today is the day of salvation. Whatever request might be, if we can assist you in any way, with the waters of baptism or the prayers of the congregation on your behalf, come forward now while we stand and while we sing.